Okay, welcome everyone. Today um, you have again the cheap version of the uh, professor available. I'm sorry for that. So today, tomorrow, I'll be uh, uh, trying to present the lecture. And today, today, we have a very, um, everybody says this, right? Today's lecture is really cool. Well, today and tomorrow, for those of you who want to show up, it's really nice. It's one of those uh, things that you can talk a lot about. And um, so, but I want to just go back what you discussed last week and uh, what we are trying to do to give a little bit of better perspective what we are trying to achieve. So we are trying to understand how computers work. We are trying to understand how to build a computer. And you already saw the single cycle architecture, right? Single cycle architecture. Yeah, you, you did it. I, there's a video, there's, there's like an evidence, you know, you cannot run away from it. And um, uh, then, does it look difficult? I mean, does it look like something spectacular? It doesn't, right? I mean, you say, yeah, there's a memory, we read something, we do this. And if you look at it, what are the steps in order to execute the program? We are doing a couple of steps, right? So we start with what? Anybody? We have somewhere there is an instruction, right? That will tell us what to do. For every cycle, we start by saying, okay, fetch the instruction. How does this work? How do we fetch the instruction? Somewhere there is a program counter, it holds an address. This address goes to a memory, inside the memory there's a bunch of ones and zeros. And apparently those bunch, uh, bunch of ones and zeros tell us what we have to do. Are we adding two numbers? Are we reading from memory? Are we writing to memory? Are we trying to make a program flow? So the second thing is we are trying to understand the code instruction. If you want, this is an Indiana Jones. There's some runes. Are you old enough to know Indiana Jones? <laughs> okay. You know, I made a gremlins joke two, year, two years ago. Nobody understood what I said. Gremlins? Yeah, exactly. This happened. <laughs> Nobody knows. Okay. Eight shows. So once you have decoded the instruction, uh, most useful instructions, not all of them, most useful instructions will want to operate on some sort of data. So it can be that you are, um, uh, you know, you have two numbers you want to add, you want to invert the number, you want to shift something. So we have to find the operands that will be part of our operation, right? So uh, get the operands, you know, somehow. And then the next step is we have some operation to do, perform, execute, let's say execute. It, it sounds bad, execute, right? No. And at the end of this execution, something comes out, not the head. Uh, you, uh, you have a result, and you want to write this result back. So store result. I mean, in detail, if we go into architectures, it might change a little bit because we have a smarter architecture, we do things a little bit differently. But in a single cycle architecture, what was the point? Anybody? Somebody said to me, nobody wants to answer questions. I said, no, no, this is okay. Yes? Exactly. So we have a way of uh, differentiating our states. We use a clock. This clock tells us when we move from one state to another state. And we can actually manage to do all these operations, one after another, in a single clock cycle. So every clock cycle, we fetch, we decode, we find the operands, we do whatever operation is necessary, we write it back. And then we start all over again, we fetch the next instruction, et cetera, et cetera. So why are we interested in this? I mean, uh, what do you ultimately care about? Yeah? Speed. Everybody wants speed. So we want speed. What does it mean? How fast can I go through these steps over and over again to produce a result, right? And uh, 
We, we will talk about this a lot. So we said, okay, there is single cycle operation. We can do everything. And then we realized this wasn't very, um, didn't look very smart. And I can tell you in advance today, almost no processor is built with a single cycle architecture. It's very nice to explain the principles because it's simple. You understand the things. This is why it comes first in the book. But then we go into some details because you want to make things better. Guess what? If you want to sell a processor, a computer, um, you know, being 10% faster than your competition is important. Nobody wants to go and buy a 21.75 megabyte or a megapixel camera. Everybody wants a 24, a 30, a 35. Nobody wants to buy a 0.9 gigahertz processor. They want 1.2, 2, 5, whatever. So uh, speed is important, and we try to think about what can we do, how can we get better. Now, there is something over the years that has helped us, and this is unique in a lot of technological things. Anybody, any idea? We have an ally that helps us. Some old gentleman who founded Intel. Yeah? Moore's law. Mr. Gordon Moore set a law and said every two years, roughly, or 18 months, we'll have double the transistors, meaning that we have some additional things we can do in the same time. And if we can make use of this, we, are, we have an advantage. And you will see a lot that um, once you have a solution, we will be able to make it better and better by uh, coming into tricks. OK, so one of the things that we noticed was not in every instruction are we using all these things, and not all of them take equally long. So what was the next idea? Yeah? We split it. Instead of doing it in one cycle, we do it in multiple cycles. For example, I mean, it looks like it's a good idea to split it into five in this, if I have it just here. Depending on how you implement your microarchitecture, it might be different. So you say, I will have just one cycle that does the fetch, one cycle that does the decode, the get operands, execute, store result, and I came to the multi-cycle architecture. So that was last week, right? So who likes the single cycle architecture better? I'm very afraid now. Who likes the multi-cycle architecture better? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> what about the rest? Indifferent. We don't care, Frank. It's not exam time. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, if you read the book, if you, if you looked into the chapters, you will have realized that the multi-cycle architecture, although it looked very nice from the beginning, in the end, when it comes to it, there was a calculation about how fast the multi-cycle architecture is compared to the single-cycle architecture. And in the book, in the Harris and Harris book, it actually turns out worse. Anybody see that? Yeah? <laughs> there are the reading assignments. You know, it really helps in the semester. Um, but OK, you're grown-ups. I'm not going to lecture you. I did. I shouldn't. OK. OK, let's go back. So we, uh, we realized that we want to do things faster. And faster will uh, tell us what we are doing. Now, once again, uh, coming back, it's the same parallel that we have. Uh, you start actually with something that's a computer program, printf, whatever, whatever, what, or whatever language you like. This will then get translated into uh, whatever processor you're using, its own syntax, right? We call it, uh, we will have things like ld dollar something, something, something. So who is going to take care of this? Ah, oh, come on. No. I'll write it, OK? And who defines, I mean, what defines, what are the words, what are the basic principle uh, instructions that the processor understands? OK, you're so insistent. <laughs> the ISA, the instruction set architecture. And this is different from, and then, what else does ISA define? So this is human lead readable. This thing will translate one to one to a bunch of ones and zeros, right? 
So you have a code, that code will get translated through the compiler to primitives of the ISA, and those things have actually a binary representation that will get stored in the end in a memory. The memory contains many, many uh, words, and one of these words will contain this program thing, and there will be this program counter that will point to it, there will be the address, and says, we are now executing this instruction. You go to the memory, fetch this, try to understand what these ones and zeros mean, and then we will go and decode and perform our in instruction. Okay, so people are saying there was a lecture supposed to be, hey, it disappeared, ah, here. Okay, so this week we are going to talk about pipelining, and pipelining is one of those smart ideas where we are doing the same thing a bit faster. And when we are talking about, uh, speed disappeared, sorry. This happens when you don't do it. Excellent. Okay, we want to achieve some speed. And when we are talking about speed, we will re re realize there are two completely different orthogonal uh, things. I'm talking about throughput and latency. Anybody have any idea what these are? Ooh. Help. Okay. Throughput. So what your colleague said is throughput is the amount of work that we do in a given amount of time, right? So it is measured in what? What can you say? I mean, do you have a unit for? Ah, sort of, no, 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah, but how much work do you do in so many clock cycles is it, right? Let me look at it this way. Oh, yeah, sorry. Instructions per? Millions of instructions per cycle. Giga operations per cycle, right? Something like this. It tells you if you can do one operation per cycle, single cycle ar architecture, and you do one billion clock cycles, one gigahertz, you can run, uh, you can operate 10 giga instructions per second. It could be floating op point operations or something like that. But what is latency then? Yes. Yeah, why not? Yes. So, and why aren't they the same? You know, this is an interesting thing. We will come back to this. Just keep in mind that uh, in 15 minutes, hopefully, we will be discussing why throughput and latency are not the same. So. The amount of time it takes us to finish an operation will be called latency. Now in a single cycle architecture, when you pick this and then do this, do this, do this, do this, your throughput and latency are going to be the same. It takes you, uh, you know, every cycle you do one instruction. So it takes one clock cycle to finish this instruction and it takes, and every clock, uh, your throughput is one uh, instruction per cycle. It's like, okay, what's the difference? And now we are trying to go and do it a little bit better. Now, Honor told me, uh, he said, Frank, this is a really important lecture. Why would he say that? We always ask questions from this lecture in the exam. Not interested at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's good, it's good. So, um, just to uh, make sure that, that you are also following up on the reading assignments. So uh, last week, we had single cycle and multi-cycle microarchitectures. We made a brief review. We are going to talk about pipelining, and this is such a brilliant idea. We'll go crazy with it. We'll do a lot of extensive, uh, more stuff, trying to make it better and better. And we will come and see a lot of issues with pipelining. So today and tomorrow, we are go going to just talk about uh, pipelining issues. 
And then we are going to realize that um, during also pipelining, there is something called out of order execution, which sounds like going completely anarchic. Don't do the things they tell you. Do it in some order, execute them as you want, everything will be fine. And then we are going to see that everything is not fine and how we can fix these issues. Um, what we see today is uh, what was necessary to make from very simple processors to, um, let's say, processors of the 2000s, like the uh, better processors. And what you'll see next week is actually what goes into making processors of the 2010s or more advanced processors. OK, so our question is now, can we do better from what we had uh, the last week? And uh, now I'll do a silly experiment. You're going to learn one of two things. Either I'm, I will be able to show you a nice example for pipelining, or you will learn when you do teaching, don't try to be creative, just show the damn slides. <laughs> OK, so I'm defining now a kind of simple word that also has a couple of different tasks. I want to make notebooks. And these notebooks I make out of a plain sheet of A4 paper. And I define some steps. I say, hey, I want to, I will first fold it once. You had this in primary school, right? <laughs> and then I'm going to fold it a second time. And now I do something really dangerous. Don't try this at home. I will cut it. And then I have two pieces. Now somehow I have to put them together and cut it once again or you know, I'm not really good at it, sorry. I didn't say we make good notebooks. I cut it, and now I'm going to use very extensive uh, postage. And ta-da, I have it. Now, no, no, it will get better. <laughs> now, uh, this is actually not very different from this type of thing, right? I needed to do different tasks, the folding, the cutting, and then the boss stitching. Is that a verb? Boss stitching. Anyway, and uh, now we want to understand how we can do this better. So what is my goal? What do you think would be my goal if I were to sell this? Make a better, sorry? Make a lot of them, right? I want to make per hour, until this lecture is over, I want to make 200 of them. So how many can I make? How do you calculate how many I can make? Anybody watch Schindler's List? <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah. One of you volunteered, so. No, I just said that I watched Schindler's List. Behind you said, how, how do I calculate it? <laughs> the part where he was making these latches, right? I mean, the guy was timing him. You, were, you can time it. Uh, you can see how long it takes for me to make one, and then you can look in one hour how many I can make. Simple division. OK, now the question is, can we do better? And uh, what's your feeling? Can we do, can I manage to do this better? What's your first idea that comes into mind? How can I make more? <coughs> yeah. Exactly. I hire some people. Instead of me <laughs> instead of me doing this, or hire better people, you could say. Uh, I could hire a bunch of people. What's the disadvantage of this? So let me just write down so that we don't forget. Get more people. What's the problem? Yes? It's harder to control as you customize. I, I assume that there is some like magical, you know, people listen to me, for example, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have to exclude you for making it more inclusive. Yes? It's expensive. Why is it expensive? But you know, I also have to buy more boss stitches, right? I have to buy more, you know, golden scissors. And so, 
parallelization will work. We can get to it why parallel architectures will work. You'll also see this as a, a parallel architecture. But there's a cost associated not only with hiring the people, which is also a part of a cost, just a second, but we will also have to hire the, um, the infrastructure needed for them to work. So this doesn't scale very well. I pay actually twice the amount of people. I pay also, I have to have more infrastructure. Then I can do it. It still works, but it's maybe we can do better. So this is what we are trying to do. Yeah, there was a question. Yes, this is exactly where we are getting at. So this is the cut part. <laughs> this is the boss stitch part. And this is the fold part. OK. And uh, I recruited some people at the beginning. I need these volunteers to show up, secret people. Yes. No, no, stand in front. It's easier. So you need your scissors. Where's the scissors? Where's the boss stitch? OK. Are you ready? ready. They will make fun of you, right? <laughs> it's horrible. OK. So now we have divided the work into three different parts. There is the folding. He has to make two folds. There is the cutting. And then there is the boss stitch, Mr. Boss stitch. And what we will do is, I am the uh, dictator here. I will dictate when. When the job is done, I'm the clock. When I make my clock signal, every part is going to, to take the input from the right side and give it further to the left side, etc., etc. And then in the end, we will have uh, our wonderful things. OK. I hope this works. <laughs> OK. So let's start first clock cycle. So I cannot start it, I cannot have the next clock cycle before he's finished. Now. <laughs> easy, easy, don't worry, the clock is very generous. <laughs> don't stress, we don't want you to cut anything. The hospital is near, but easy, very slow, very slow. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it's not easy. Come on, don't laugh. Okay, just hold it. You're still not done with it. You cannot give it away. Okay, at this point, we call this operation a pipeline. We have divided the operation into three distinct parts. And at this point, the first data arrived to the end. The next clock cycle, it will be finished, and I will have my first unit. And uh, you see the different colors actually signal different data or different uh, pieces being in operation. Now let's go one more clock cycle. So I have one unit out. How long did it take for this one unit to propagate? How many hits? Four. Four. <laughs> OK, so if you think about it, the operation, sorry, you're waiting still, I'm sorry. The operation didn't take actually any faster than I would normally have done myself. Do you realize that? It's actually this, I couldn't magically make this faster. But now, second cycle, in one fourth of the time, I already have the second result in my hand. So I have actually a higher throughput than I would have done it alone. I'm not using more of the resources. I just use one boss stitch, one uh, scissors, and one folding technician. <laughs> and there you go. You know, this is, this is a production. We are going well. OK. I promise them I will not keep them for longer than uh, five minutes or 10 minutes. What's the problem here? Do you realize the problem? Yes? The cutter is bad. <laughs> <laughs> the cutter is gorgeous. No, no problem with the cutter. His job is difficult. 
But this is a problem, right? I mean, how many times can I get faster? If every piece of operation took exactly the same amount of time, I could have, in theory, gotten three times faster, right? But it doesn't work like that. Who has the simplest job? <laughs> Who says boss stitch? <laughs> no, he's, he's just helping. He's a feeder. He has... OK, so this is now a problem. Now we are going to rearrange it. Let's clean the pipeline. Let's get rid of everything which is half finished. What kind of operation do we do? We decide now that we are going to make two cutters. So he will fold and cut. He will fold and cut. And he will still bow stitch. <laughs> what did we do? We had this more difficult operation, which was cutting. And it was holding up the entire operation. We said, let's split it between two people. Yes? Could be. Other alternatives could be. Yes, that's not a bad idea. But this time, let's just try this first. And we will see a lot of other ideas coming in. Yes? Uh, Mr. Burton is doing the safe way. He can only do one operation per, per clock time. Yes. So if he gets to, assuming he gets to folder and color papers, he can only ask of one. So there's going to be an exception. With his idea, yeah, you could say maybe the boss stitch is cheaper than the scissor, and then you could afford to have two boss stitches. You know, that, that will be, but it's a very good question, and these are really arguments that go into, believe it or not, computer architecture design, okay? It's simplified a little bit. Can I have it after they, after they start? Okay, so now, fold cut, fold cut, boss stitch. Let, oh, yeah, let's go. You think they would get better at it, right, over time? <laughs> it's not fair, it's not fair. Now who is slow? See? Okay. So do you see that it's actually going faster? What we did is, we will come back to this in the slides in a few seconds, is balancing the stages, the individual stages of operating the pipeline. So thanks a lot for participating. Please give a round of applause to your friends. And now let's see if we can recover the lecture with the slides. So, uh, this is what we were seeing, I mean, coming back now to, to, the, to the lecture slides. Uh, what were the limitations that we were seeing with the multi-cycle architecture? We realized that when you're doing this individually, there are all these resources, like the postage or the scissor, that is standing around doing nothing. So one idea is, hey, can I make use of it? And uh, so these are the things. So fetch logic is idle when an instruction is being decoded or executed. So we want to have more concurrency. We want to have everything that we have in our architecture doing something useful. And we want to, uh, we, we want to divide it uh, between different operations. So this is essentially what we did in, uh, in this div division. OK, so here goes the pipelining thing. And uh, sorry, this. So we divide the instruction processing cycle into distinct stages. This was our folding, cutting, and both stitching. And we will process a different instruction in each stage. Uh, more or less, you saw that while we are processing, the, uh, the red one was over there, the yellow one is here, the blue one is here. So they are different notebooks. And within our hardware, or within our system, uh, pieces of it at different levels of completion were around there. And we wanted to increase the instruction processing throughput. Why? Because we wanted to get speed. Now the question is the latency. Did we make the processing of one of these things any faster? Yes or no? No. If anything, did it take maybe longer? Yes, we had to hand over to the architect. 
Perfect. There was, an, uh, there was an overhead of handing over. We will see this. There is another reason why it took slightly longer. Because, yeah? Exactly. We couldn't divide the operation into equal size chunks, and we had to wait for the slowest one, remember? So if they are unequal, like the boss stitch, uh, we couldn't uh, take advantage of the fact that we are dividing it equally, so it's also getting a bit slower. However, uh, the latency did not decrease. It stayed, in the ideal case, it stays the same, or maybe it increases a little bit. Throughput, though. Did we increase the throughput? Yes. By how much? Um, about three, three, four times, yeah. Yeah, there were three stages, actually. So we have three times uh, the throughput uh, that we would normally have when, if, if we didn't have these things going in. Because if, if, that was, if it was only this guy doing a multi-cycle operation, and I get the output, and I couldn't use any of the resources before, it would have taken me all of this folding, uh, both stitching, cutting, whatever, would have taken me three cycles. So uh, now I have three times as many throughput while the latency remains the same. And this is a good thing. It almost comes for free, right? No, you're not excited about this? This is brilliant. This is what made Henry Ford a billionaire. But, uh, and we want to take advantage of this as much as possible. So in the remaining uh, minutes, we are going to discuss how much more can we milk this. And when we are trying to do this, there will be a few problems that we will be able to discuss and learn a little bit more. So the question is, what's the downside, right? So we will come to this towards the end. Now the examples are, uh, this is again the fetch, decode, execute, write back. So roughly fetch, decode, execute, store results. Somehow the get operands has merged into here. Doesn't matter. And uh, this would be the multi-cycle operation. So you do the four, then you start the next four, then you start the next four. And this is what we did. So we are uh, dividing it into simple works. And as soon as we fetched one, we start fetching the other one, we start fetching the other one. So this is the part that does the first uh, folding, then comes the uh, cutting and both stitching, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and the, uh, the thing is that instead of finishing it here, now we are able to finish here. For any given instruction, the latency didn't change. So we had exactly the same amount of time needed to finish things from start to end. However, if you look at throughput, at this point, I have already four outputs. Whereas for four outputs, I needed this amount of time. So uh, in the book, I believe they have a laundry analogy. I couldn't get the washing machines and laundry in here. It would have helped me, but OK. It's the, uh, it's the same thing. Now here, we also have, in minutes, uh, we are also discussing the same issue. I'm going over the slides a little bit quicker because we already had these discussions. In this case, the uh, laundry, uh, no, the dryer, that's the dryer, right? The, the dryer seems to be the slowest part, and that one decides how fast I can operate these individual things. So the slowest person is deciding how fast uh, I can do this. So the ideal pipeline is I increase the throughput with no cost, actually, or with little cost. And you repeat identical operations, and uh, you have these uniformly partitionable uh, sub-operations. When we are doing this folding, cutting, notepad example, we realize that this is not always possible, even in the, uh, in the simplest case. So now let's come and take a look at what it was. So above, we have uh, the case of the single cycle instruction. We again have these combinational logic. So we fetch, we decode, we execute, we have memory access, we have write back. And that takes some amount of time to complete. And then you can uh, calculate the bandwidth about how fast we can do. And in an ideal case, we will just take, there are five operations, and we'll say, you know what? This FTE magically takes half the time 
It takes doing all the five operations, and these two, magically, take exactly half the amount of time. And if I do this, I can have two pipeline stages, and every time I first operate these two, then these two, while I'm doing this, for the next instruction, I'm doing the other one, and I have two times the bandwidth, three times, 10 times, right? Isn't it nice? You can go to infinity. Nobody's excited about this. Nobody comes and says, Frank, why don't we do a thousand stage pipeline? Yes? Yes, unfortunately, the reality will hit us in the face. But if you're not dreaming, you will also not get things done, OK? So it's always good when you see something like this to think in the limits. You know, don't say, don't be happy that, oh, I can do one stage pipelining. No, go ahead and say, I'll do 1,000. What's the problem with doing 1,000? Because that way, you will also see where are the limits of your ideas. So now, the more realistic pipeline is uh, the following. We first realized that there is also some overhead associated with adding, uh, adding these, uh, these additional flip-flops in between here. What is this? There is a setup time of the flip-flop required to be able to store it. In our live demo case, you saw that there was some handover from one phase to the other one when I was hitting on the table. So this thing is also adding uh, now a little bit to the, uh, to the delay, and our bandwidth is no longer uh, ideal, but we are having, if you have a case stage pipeline version, per uh, bandwidth per case stage is going to come uh, in here. So the latch delay or the flip-flop delay is going to add uh, some overhead. Now, there is another uh, version. It's also adding some amount of gates, because here I had two flip-flops at the beginning and end, and at, let's say, G number of gates. And ideally, I'm dividing this uh, G over K. <coughs> but now I also have the latches. So these additional latches I'm putting in between are also increasing some of my costs, so it makes it slightly more expensive. The problem is, when I go to the extremes, if this thing gets smaller and smaller and smaller, if I go to 1,000, and I only have 1,000 gates here, I go to 1,000, there's a single gate remaining. And for every single gate, I'm putting a rather large latch in between. I'm not gaining anything at that moment. Questions so far? All very quiet. Everybody comes to sleep. <laughs> OK, so we are again back to this thing, fetch the code. Evaluate address, fetch operands, execute store result. Does it bother you that every time we talk about it, they are slightly different? It bothers you? A little bit. Okay, it's on purpose actually. Well, you could say you're just lazy, you're just copying, pasting from random slides. Who thinks that? <laughs> Why is this part nicer to me? <laughs> I think there was a clear divide. <laughs> OK. It's actually, um, it's, um, it's not like we are not cutting pacing from different slides. We are. Uh, let's, let's be honest. But there is, there is an advantage of seeing them slightly differently, because you do not get locked in in one type of explanation. What is described here and what is described here are actually very similar, very same. Sometimes some of those operations get uh, longer. You have fetch, decode, evaluate address, calculate the address, fetch operands, execute store result. Sometimes you see the fetch operands, sometimes you see the evaluate address because in one architecture it maybe takes more time, it's harder to do it. So uh, we are not doing it because we are completely evil. We are also trying to prepare you to different architectures that you see. And you will be reading it from different books. You'll be seeing articles, papers in, uh, in, in your career. So you don't get, but in the lecture, they told us there was only four of them. It could be divided into different uh, parts. So this is now what we are trying to do. And we will try to come to a pipeline architecture. Uh, we already did the single cycle one. So how difficult can it be? You see, in the beginning of the lecture, sorry. Sorry? 
we will have problems. But you know, you know what? Somebody tells you that by putting some funny pipeline registers, and they look so simple. I mean, look at the idea. I don't understand. I mean, I understand that you are not very thrilled about it, but look at this. This is my single cycle processor. I just put these gray boxes in between, and magically things get three times faster. Huh? Download speed three times faster. Anybody? <laughs> huh? Three times more salary. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> my car drives three times faster. Nobody is interested in cars anymore. Okay. My car drives three times longer with the same electric charge, more green. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Those are, those are crazy numbers. You know, you, you would love to get them. It's not so easy, especially if you're working in technology. Getting to such X numbers is not very easy. And guess what? You will pay a price. I mean, if it sounds too good to be true, there is a catch with it. The problem is, are we smart enough, or does Moore's law give us enough transistors also to fight against all these problems that are coming? And even after, you know, we sacrifice a little bit, you know, the ones in the back, they were caught by the wolves and things and things, and still we have a lot to gain in the end. But it's an excellent point. It is going to cost us, and uh, uh, the next lecture mostly is going to be about what are the costs and how can we uh, how can we fight these things? And we will see we have a lot of different, uh, we have different uh, alternatives. So before the break, let's start with the single cycle architecture once again. So remember how we, what we were talking about. So we had this printf load that was converted to ones and zeros, was stored in the memory. There was a program counter, had an address. Yeah, yeah break is coming. <laughs> Winter came and break is also coming. Okay. <laughs> so the program counter, instruction memory, we read it out, we divide the instruction into pieces, and each of these pieces tells us something. For example, the upper bits here, they are telling us whether or not we are doing an addition, we are doing a subtraction, are we doing a branch, are we doing something else? And then we realize that here, here is the part where we are going to do the additions, subtractions, multiplications, and things like that. It's going to need its data from this register file. And part of this decoder will be the address of the first register, the address of the second register. We are going to do something. It goes into, maybe goes into data memory, maybe bypasses it. And then we are going to read things. And the result will land in the register file. <laughs> See the people yawning? OK, how can we do this? Well, we just bring in the uh, brigade of divisions, and we say, this part is where we fetch the instruction. Here's the instruction memory. Here's the program counter. Uh, here is the logic needed to calculate the next address. So normally, if there is no branch, the program counter will be just itself plus the next instruction, in this case, 4, because it's a byte address system. And here, we are going to uh, decode the instruction, and we will read the contents of the registers. And here, we are going to do the execution. We are going to do address calculation, maybe the address calculation for a branch, or we will do a calculation for, uh, for producing the ALU result. And here, we will have a memory access. And then here, either we are reading from memory or we have an address, or we have a data from the ALU. We are going to write it back all the way to this register file. Divided it into parts. And uh, now, just to make the thing a little bit clearer, since this guy was going backwards, write this, OK? Just to illustrative purposes, we are having this register file right here, it's ghosted because, you know, it actually goes back there, but give it a minute. Okay, there's another problem. Who was asking for problems? Yeah, there are problems, see, you know, all these yellow things are problems. And now, see, this guy was in this stage, but we need to go here through the marks and update here. Problem again, let's just ignore it. It's engineering work, right? Let's see if we can get something out of it. Later, we will try to uh, see. 
Now comes the question, is this the correct partitioning? Correct according to what? Anything? So you think about that, we continue 15 fast, okay? Okay, part two. So we have our architecture, we made this division, and the last question we were asking before the break was, is this the correct partitioning? Why did I use one, two, three, four, five stages? Why wasn't it two, why wasn't it 100? Why wasn't it, why did I take this as a boundary and maybe not in the middle of here? So these are all the choices we make when we are deciding on an architecture, on a, on a micro architecture. And we will, uh, it doesn't have an ideal solution. It depends, it will also depend partially on some of the decisions we made earlier. This one implements this instruction set architecture. It has certain properties. Those properties require certain amount of hardware to be here. If it was a different instruction set architecture, maybe we could have used a different uh, thing and still could have been um, equally effective or even more effective. But these are very good questions that you should be asking yourself. And uh, the answers to these questions actually end up being all the different processors we have available today. One thing to remember, there is not the ideal processor, otherwise people are smart enough in the last 60, 70 years or so, uh, for the time we are doing processors, you would have figured it out and you would get like this two page sheet which says, this is the only way to build a processor, do this or die, okay? <laughs> Fortunately, we are not dying, so we can continue. Now, about this, particular division, so we are uh, following the one on the book. So again, what we have here at the top is the single cycle architecture. It can also be uh, executed in multiple cycles, but here you have already some times, right? So there is a time axis. You see that everything together takes 800 picoseconds. There's instruction fetch, register, ALU, data access, register. Now, once you divide it with the division that we have, you say, okay, let's have these, uh, these divisions here. So each one of them is uh, 200 picoseconds. Now I have the instruction fetch here. The register access is not, well, it doesn't take so long, but it was like the Bostitch there, right? I mean, it's waiting for most of the time. And then, you know, say, aha, Bostitch, done. And uh, the ALU takes long, the data access uh, takes long, and then I have the register access here, which for some nice magical uh, reason happens to fit just this perfectly. Okay, it's just an example. And so if you look at what the timing is, how much I am getting faster, and if you calculate the timing, it's a five stage, uh, it's a five stage pipeline. Ideally, I wanted to have five times speed up, but I'm getting four, not five. And why is that? Because there is this empty uh, part, which was uh, due to the fact that I was not able to, uh, to, to process these things, uh, divide my pipeline into equally sized chunks. Some of them were shorter, and since I have to wait for the longest operation, I'm losing a bit of this thing. Remember, we, we said, hey, this 3x, 5x is great, so we want to get the most out of it. We were so, uh, you know, we wanted it. And, and then, you know, you start sacrificing here and there a little bit because that was the um, more practical way of dividing it. Now, we are trying to go to this pipelining thing. So this was the idea that we had single cycle. Here we had the registers and this is the entire combinational path here. And we want to in insert our registers in between. So we want to do this, divide this uh, long combinational path into smaller combinational paths that are separated by registers. Simple enough? Ta-da, here comes our registers. So there is one set of registers, so all signals going this way are, uh, you know, this is the handover part from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. Um, we still have some little issues to, that we need to uh, solve. And uh, we, 
We now realize, for example, that here I have the, uh, the, the uh, when I'm going from here to here, these ones are actually separate registers for all of the outputs. So for example, this is the output of the ALU, this is the output of the register file A, B, this is the immediate value, this is the instruction register, et cetera, et cetera. So they are actually uh, not one register for everything, but you know, there is individual signals crossing the paths. And uh, the important thing now is, Remember when we divided this in our uh, paper cutting exercise, we still did not increase the number of bostage or the scissors that we use. We are not adding resources that are being utilized at the same time uh, by different parts. Sorry, yes, yeah, question? Uh, for the NPTM. Sorry? Uh, for the, uh, for the, for the wire coming from NPTM. For the wire coming out of... Uh, This one? Yeah. It go also to the last uh, To here, you mean? Yeah. No, well, you know, this was the one of those loops that's going back. We'll come to that. Good point, good catch. There's also this, uh, this evil thing which is going back. You know, those loops, we'll have to handle about it. It will come. Okay? So, we also need to... Uh, no matter what type of instruction I have now, remember we had different types of instructions. Anybody remember different instruction types in MIPS, for example, because we are studying MIPS most of the time? Yes? Sorry? R type? Register type, we had immediate types, we had jump instructions and things like that. They were a little bit different because the R type required uh, access to the register file, whereas the jump instruction, for example, well, there is one which reads the registers, but normally the jump register just uses the immediate to jump to some other place. And no matter what instruction now, it has to go through exactly the same stages, even if it doesn't make any register access, even if it's not writing back anything, he still has to be pushed through everything there. So the instruction will go one by one. So if you have your load word, this is a load word getting executed. You decode it, you execute it. Well, load word makes sense. And then you are going to write it back. So these are the parts that are uh, accessible. And uh, does this have any performance impact when every instruction has to go through everywhere? Yeah? Yes, and we will have to go through the entire pipeline, although, for example, I just assume that not everything needs to be boss stitch, but you still have to wait for the boss stitch stage, although you are not doing anything there. It's just uh, somehow there. So this is one of the issues. And now here we have the second one. Now look at this. I have two instructions. So first, I'm executing this instruction. I am uh, using register one. Uh, the content of uh, register one, I add an offset of 20, and whatever is there in memory, that's an address, will be loaded into register number 10. Instruction number one, why? Because that's what the compiler gave me, you know, I'm sorry. And now, once this instruction uh, starts going, I have here another one, which is, you know, taking the content of register two, uh, register three, and is subtracting them, and is writing them back to register 11. Now, they go side by side through all of these uh, instructions. Uh, I do the memory access. I come here. I write back. Subtraction it doesn't have a memory access, really. So that's, an, well, it has to go through there, but it's not really needed, but it's in the way. More or less, you want to go out of this place and say, okay, I don't care. I'm not looking at the shops or anything. I will just... Uh, finish my thing. Now, here is the question, and this is what we will be discussing today and also tomorrow, the whole time. You can realize that we explained this beautiful thing. We are getting free throughput. Everything is gorgeous. And now for three hours, we are discussing what kind of a mess we will bring ourselves into. So is life always this beautiful? 
The answer is? Yes. <laughs> Excellent answer. Life is beautiful. Don't worry about pipelines. Well, life is beautiful, but the computers aren't always. Oh, they are gorgeous. Come on. You should just look at it. The... One has to wait. One instruction waits to register the next one reads from it. Then you can try to find a slow now. We will see. Now we are going to see why we are having why we need smarter people to deal with pipeline computer architecture. So maybe you should look at it this way. If it was easy, everybody would do it. It needs smarter people so that uh, we need to, you know, attend these classes. No. I love the enthusiasm. <laughs> okay, don't worry, don't worry. You're doing great. I mean, I've seen much worse. <laughs> There were eggs and tomatoes involved. <laughs> OK. So once again, this is uh, for pipelining operation. Another thing. So the first instruction, instruction fetch. Second time, while you're decoding, we are fetching the second instruction. Uh, while we're executing the first instruction, the second instruction is decoded. The third one is fetch. Memory, execute, decode. And now, finally, in T4, all my pipeline has been filled. This was the case, if you remember, when we were folding and cutting and everything, that I started pushing this thing, and at some point, we started talking about it. This is the point where the, um, where the uh, entire pipeline is full, and everything after that is going to be a useful operation. My pipeline is ready. Until now, I didn't do anything. You know, my pipeline was useless until now. Nothing came out of it. But right now, we are full. After this point, every cycle is useful. We are coming to that. We are coming to that. We are starting with the nice uh, stories. Don't worry. We will get, get there. But this is just so that you understand the principle of pipelining, how things come together. OK. Now, uh, this was, once we said, it's a steady state where our pipeline is completely full. And uh, if, you, if you want, this is the same uh, kind of thing where you see how the resources are utilized. So we have an instruction fetch stage, decode stage, execute stage, memory access stage, write back stage. And here, only the instruction fetch is busy. Here, two of them, three, four, five. And after that, all stages are continuously busy. If you remember at the very, very first slide, we said the good news, I mean, what we want to achieve for better performance is to use all these values concurrently. And the, the more we can do concurrently, the better we are looking. OK. Now, we uh, have also a lot of these control signals that are going from one side uh, to, the, to the other side. And we have to make sure that we are also carrying over our uh, control signals. Now. What are the control signals? The control signals tell we have a number of options. We can add two numbers or subtract two numbers, so, or we can add two numbers. We can either do this or that. All of these decisions are what we call collectively as the control signals. The instruction decoder looks at the instruction and realizes what kind of choices we have to make in the given architecture. Now, we need to move them together with the instruction. It's not only the data that moves. We also have to carry the control instructions together. Now, basically, you have two options. Number one is you have those ones and zeros that ended up being your instruction, right? So these are the instruction ones and zeros. And these ones, if you know where to look, it tells you what to do, add two numbers. Take number one from register one, take number two from register 17, add them and write them back to register number 13, whatever. And all this strange information is encoded in these ones and zeros. Either I carry this one over, and at every stage I decode it wherever needed, or, sorry, so this is the option one, I decode it once, and then I say, ah, oh, these are the signals for the write back, for the memory, for the execute stage. And I'm just pushing them along. As we go, say, ah, oh, OK, that was the commands from the last time. Or I have a 
Second option, I carry the relevant information down and each one of them does the decoding themselves. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. So which one is better? Well, those are all those type of questions that will also boil down. There is no definitive answer. These are all good questions. And you will also be asking yourself when you're studying for the exam. Some of them determine, are determined by the ISA. There are some instruction set architectures which try to make decoding friendlier. Making decoding friendlier may result in silly looking instructions. Do you think, I mean, does anybody, uh, you did a little bit of uh, assembly on MIPS, did you? Not yet? No, no exercise yet, okay, so. Do you remember the load instruction? <coughs> so there is a, It has a following funny format. Anybody realize this? Who has seen this instruction before? Okay, some more hands. Excellent. Don't you think it looks a little bit silly? I have to read the address from here, then I have to add an offset. Even if I don't need an offset, all I have to do is write zero here. Why, right? Did anybody ask the question why? Did anybody else ask the question why? Okay, do you know the answer? It is decoding friendlier. It says, you know what? We are going to need this kind of accesses one way or another. Let me not have two different load instructions, one with offset and one without offset. Makes decoding more difficult. So let me choose something which is simpler. Regardless of what, I'm always going to do this. And you know, if there is no offset, just write a zero there. That's, you know, making it, and those are all these kinds of options that will lead to these uh, different instructions. Okay, so, was there a question? No. So in this case, you are seeing that the control was decoded, the write back stage was decoded, goes here, it's stored, goes here, and at this point, we have the control that goes to this multiplexer, and this multiplexer now knows that I'm going to pick my input from memory or from the ALU, and then he's going to send it back. At the same time, we are telling him, now it is the time to write back to the uh, memory. I, but what I did was, I knew what I was going to decode, what this instruction is doing, and I'm saying, tell the next stage, which tells the next stage, which tells the next stage that when the time comes, we are writing back to the register, okay? And says, tell the next stage, we are writing back to the register. And it says, write back to the register. <laughs> okay, great. Um, once again, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, very fast because it's the same one now explained from the example uh, in a different book, but the, uh, the uh, story is actually the same. I encourage you to take a look at it. If you have questions, I'll be here before the lecture. You can come and ask questions about them. So uh, it's good to see not always exactly the same drawing so that you can also realize what is really the case and what is specific to one architecture. Now. What we wanted to do was we wanted to increase the throughput with little increase in cost. And uh, we, we realized that there are identical operations, the operations are independent, the uh, sub-operations can be partitioned uniformly, and, uh, and they shouldn't share any resources. So this was our goal, okay? Can I take it later? Okay. This, this was our goal. And uh, there are some cases where this actually works out very well. Automobile assembly, doing laundry, sort of, because we don't care so much. But, uh, but the instruction processing in a cycle is not necessarily always the same, because we don't have identical operations. 
We are, we are sometimes decoding instructions that are wildly different from each other. We will see when we are coming to more realistic processors, uh, fetching some data from memory takes much, much longer than adding two numbers. Uniform sub-operations, you already saw in Bostich uh, story, this is not really happening always. And now comes the other one, which is going to disturb us a lot more, independent operations. Like, I could just push things through the pipeline, they have nothing to do with each other, the result of one is not needed by the other, or something like that. Unfortunately, it's not the case. Is it reason to panic? Not really, but we have to deal with it. So, sorry, I had to do this. So, the instructions are not independent to each other. So what, what can we do? Well, we have to force different instructions to go through the same pipeline, even though they are different. We need to uh, somehow force each stage to be controlled by the same clock. You can do some tricks. And if there are any kind of dependencies, we need to fix them, find them, detect them, and resolve them. And um, we will now, and this is one of the more uh, involved parts of this, is trying to figure out what kind of problems we have and what, how can we uh, address these things. So uh, the first one is balancing work in pipeline stages. You know? There was a question, why did we divide it into these things? It looked more natural because you know, we are evil, we are using teaching material. We already draw the uh, block diagram in a way to show that uh, it's nicely divided. If you saw how, I, how that drawing was, it was almost asking, put the pipeline stage here. Frank, look here, I, I left some room in between. This is where I'm going to put the drawing and you know, it will have this thing. However, jokes aside, when you are doing and you are looking at the microarchitecture, these are the kind of choices you are seeing. And uh, we, we will have to, well, one thing we didn't talk about, maybe we should go back to it, we wanted to do a lot of speed, right? So this was our goal, and we said, hey, I want to have speed. Who wants to have a fast processor? Okay, who wants to have a processor that actually does what it's supposed to do? Which one is more important? <laughs> Good one, no? You want to have speed, but you don't want to uh, say, I want to have the fastest processor that every now and then does the right thing. You want to have the fastest processor that actually functions correctly, does what it is supposed to do, doesn't lose data, doesn't forget something, doesn't overwrite things. We want to keep the pipeline full because we know that once the pipeline is full, we are getting full benefit of the throughput. We want to keep the pipeline moving because this is how, at the end, I am able to get the results I want. If the pipeline is stopping and not going, uh, we have a problem. And we will have dependencies, and we have divided it into two things, so there were the control signals that we were talking about, as well as the data that has been moving around. And uh, there will be some resource contention, multiple operations may want to access the same resource, the memory, for example, and we will have to deal with that. There will be some operations which have a longer latency, Adding or making an XOR operation between two operands is not the same difficulty as having a double precision floating point addition operation, which takes, whatever you look at it, takes much longer, more transistors are involved in doing that. And then we will also have some issues with handling what we call interrupts and exceptions. While the program is running, something may disturb us, we may need to stop the operation, and then once this issue is over, we may want to continue. Whether or not this is internal or external is going to tell us if we are doing exceptions or interruptions. And not only that, once we manage that it's correct, it's moving, it's full, uh, people are going to come and say, I want to do it as fast as possible, so we are trying to look at where am I losing any speed, why am I doing faster? Okay. So we, the, the primary way of resolving our problems, if uh, there's a resource contention or something is, remember the data is moving through the pipeline, 
every cycle they cop get copied to the other one, get copied to the other one. If something is wrong, you can stall it. Stalling the pipeline means actually uh, you are no longer moving the pipeline. You wait one cycle, two cycles, three cycles until the uh, until this thing has been resolved. What could they be? It could be a resource contention, it could be a dependency, or it could be a long latency operation. And uh, now, what are these dependencies and uh, what are their types? <laughs> this is, it's a bit of a difference between computer architects and electrical engineers. Some people call them hazards, pipeline hazards. It's negative, right? I mean, there's something, there's a hazard in your pipeline. Oh my God. I mean, data dependency or a de de uh, control dependency or data dependency sounds much more like a technical problem. And uh, yes, just a second. So the, the first problem is the uh, so-called resource contention. This happens when two instructions in different pipeline stages, so there is one instruction that is, uh, let's say, in the fetch stage, and there is one instruction in the execution stage, and they both, within the same clock cycle, want to access the same resource. So there's a contention for the same resources. You, uh, what are the solutions? Well, uh, the simplest thing, and this was actually was one of the questions when we were talking about Somebody wanted to duplicate, uh, put two people for doing something, and they said, uh, the boss stitch cannot deal with it in one cycle, you will have. Somebody was commenting on that, right? Remember? So, duplicate the resource or increase its throughput. You know, put two boss stitches here. If there are two coming, maybe I can, I can deal with this. Well, it has its uh, pros and cons, you know. In, in our case, one of the things that this was also asked during the break, Frank, how come the memory includes all data and instructions and we seem to be reading from uh, the instructions from one memory and we seem to be writing to a completely different memory? It's a cop-out, I agree. It's, it's one of the solutions where you have separate instruction and uh, data memories, also called the hybrid architecture. Or in the case of this we do for the instruction and data memory, we do the same thing. We use a more complicated memory for the registers. We have two registers which we read in the same cycle. And uh, we can sometimes, uh, we can sometimes manage to do these things. It has a cost and all these decisions to make, whether or not we like one solution over the other one, as I said once again, determines whether or not we are making one architecture or the other one. The second problem is if there is a contention, two people want to use it, grant one of them the resource and stall the pipeline until that resource is free. Once the resource is free, you can let the things go. This brings an uncomfortable uh, question, right? So if you are a processor, all pipeline stages are your kids. Which one are you favoring more? Shall I grant him or him? Mommy, mommy chocolate. I mean, you know, uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, thing you have. So uh, to go back to the processor, and more realistic, you can, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, you can design a processor architecture with a single read and write port. So you can either read from the register file or write to the register file, but not both at the same time. And uh, what would you do? Uh, so if you are following the book, the Harris and Harris book, you notice that the register file is kind of funny. You realize that when you are reading it, uh, you can, it only takes half the clock cycle, and we are writing to it, it only takes this, uh, I mean, the first half cycle you can write to it, the second half cycle you can read through it. It's sort of like a time multiplexing. In the morning, I'm with this guy, in the afternoon, I'm with this. <laughs> You're not thinking straight. <laughs> okay. So if you can, I, I mean, this is one solution to the problem. Is it the only solution? No. It may work out very well in this exercise for this particular uh, architecture. It's not the universal solution. It's just one of the solutions uh, to do this. What's the price we say, uh, pay? Well, we only have half a clock cycle to complete this operation. 
All the other operations, let's say data uh, memory, instruction memory access, execution, have the entire clock cycle, whereas these operations have only half the clock cycle. This is a, you know, the decision was to share them. Sharing means time sharing, and if you say, hey, okay, if I can fit it, if this works, it's fine. Now, if this half cycle operation becomes your critical part, you may start, uh, you may start regretting your decision later on. And these, hey, is this a good trade-off or not, is going to determine much of our things. But what is more common and what uh, people are much more interested in are these uh, uh, three data dependencies. So they are called with different names. So uh, they have, uh, the first one is the one that we call the true data dependence. In other words, it's called read after write. R-A-W, you see also. Uh, you will also see it referred to as flow dependence. We are going to cover them, so don't worry. Uh, then there is the output dependence, which is write after write, or W-A-W. And there is the anti-dependence, which is just the one reversed, that you have a write after read dependency. We don't have a read after read dependency. Okay. Here's one question. Which one do you think would cause a stall in the pipeline? Yes? Read after write will definitely cause a pipeline stall, yes. Anything else? The exam is in August, you want to say, okay. Everyone will cause a pipeline stall. You know why? Because it's not only, I mean, we are trying to make sure that the in, uh, microarchitecture is executing the program as it was intended. It cannot be that we are overwriting values before they can be used. It cannot be that we are uh, producing wrong results. And all of these, these dependencies, tell us that we have an issue and we need to resolve them. There is no going, uh, uh, away from them. Now, the flow dependence is one of the ones that comes in the most. It's also the easiest to explain. Uh, but the and the uh, the anti dependence or the output dependence exists because we don't have enough registers. The flow dependency is one which is real. This is why we also say it's a true data dependence. There is, it comes from the nature of the program. It is inherent in the program itself. The other two, well, the other two are a problem of the limited way that we have provided a microarchitecture. It's not necessarily a problem uh, per se. If we had unlimited number of registers, if we had unlimited number of places to write things, they would go away. And uh, tomorrow, hopefully, we will also see how we can manage to do things like that. So, if you want, uh, they are, um, they are, they do not depend on the value that you want to, uh, that you have in the program. It will become clearer, hopefully. They are a dependence on the name, on the name of the register, not the value it contains. Whereas this one uh, is uh, limited to the uh, value. So here is a short summary of what they are. And uh, here at the very, very top, you see the flow dependence. So you operate with R1 and R2, and you write the result into R3. Right in the next instruction, and this is not uncommon, because you calculated R3, now you're operating on R3 plus, or operation whatever, R4 to give you R5. Now, the problem is, before you can execute the second line, the first line has to be written back. You have to have that value available. Otherwise, uh, you know, if the first instruction is still calculating while you are, uh, you start executing the second one, you may not get the result what you want. You have to avoid this. Antidependence is, is kind of uh, the, uh, uh, the, oh, now I got confused. The antidependence is kind of the, the same way. You have here a dependence that you have R1 operating with R2, and in the next line, you are operating R4, uh, R4 and R5. Now, 
This R1 is not, uh, it's not the problem. I mean, the problem there was we first had to calculate R3 so we could use it. Here the problem is uh, this one could get overwritten before this one is used, consumed in the operation. It depends on what is happening, how the operations are executed, but if we are not careful, this is not automatic, we cannot always guarantee that before I use this, I overwrite this, although it looks like it's a later operation. And then there is the output dependence, where I, am, I have one operation writing to R3, I have another operation writing to R3, and it shouldn't be that this guy writes first, this guy writes later. Okay? You want that first this guy completes its operation, then this guy completes its operation. You're saying, Frank, that doesn't make any sense. Who says, Frank, that doesn't make any sense? <laughs> Am I that good? <laughs> okay. We will see these things a little bit later, but let's just start with a simple uh, pipeline operation example where we have the load word and the sub. And this time, we will uh, go through, we had this example uh, anyway, so there is a load word, it's going through, and it's using the register one, it's using register two and three, and this one is writing to register 11. So everything is nice and dandy, and we go through. We don't care about the instructions before and after, and we have this thing done. Now comes the question that you should ask yourself. At the moment, it went very well, because the subtraction uses two and three. The load word uses one and is writing to 10. What would have happened if the subtraction actually will subtract 10 from three? Everybody see the problem? Because at this point, where is 10? 10 will be written, not here, not here. Only now, 10 will be written here. And after I write it, I'll be able to read it. But by that time, our subtraction instruction is long gone. So we will have a problem if we are not, uh, if the sub instruction were, was dependent on load work, we would have a problem. So this is our main issue now. So the reading notes, uh, this is important. So Harrison Harris chapter 7.5 to 7.9. Uh, is only about these issues, as well as the Smith and Soy, the microarchitecture of superscalar processors. Uh, these ones is for more advanced pipelining that we are going to see tomorrow, as well as interrupt and exception handling, as well as the out of order and superscalar execution, which is going to be the topic of next week. How do we handle these things? And uh, of all the lecture slides, because I had to study them just like you did, uh, this is my favorite, Frank's favorite slide. It is red and blue and white and black. <laughs> okay, why? Because if you think about it, and after the lecture, that should stay, uh, remain in your uh, thing, the flow dependence things, there are five things you can do. And the combinations of these will make us a complex processor, the processors that we use today. And they can be summarized with just these few simple tricks. So if there is a flow dependency, we can detect and wait. We can wait until the value is available in the register file. Remember before what was happening that we said, what happens if the subtraction depends on the load word that was coming before it? If this is an issue, wait, let the load word finish and we'll just hold the pipeline until the load word has finished and written back its value. The second thing is, well, this is the easy way, right? I mean, everybody sees this, this should be really easy. Wait for the pipeline, let the first instruction go, it's like a multi-cycle architecture, it finishes, and then we continue with the pipeline operation. It's not very nice, we are losing a bit of throughput. Well, we are losing throughput, we are also paying for that particular instruction a latency penalty, but we can deal with it we can detect and forward the data to the dependent instruction. Now, this is really nice because you say, I know what is going to happen. 
I know that I have to store the result. I have it already. And you know what? While nobody is looking, I'm just going to give you the result. It's like cheating in the exam, right? You're supposed to you know, go here, finish the pipeline execution, and then say, this is the value. Whereas you realize the guy behind you needs the answer. You're not waiting until the end of the exam, and you're saying, here, you're passing in forward. <laughs> Looks crazy. OK, we do this. Uh, detect and eliminate the dependence at the software level. Uh-huh, this is interesting. Since the hardware is unable to do this, and we realize that these instructions, I mean, we know what, how they are structured, there is a compiler that takes our code and converts it into the load, store, whatever, whatever instructions. The moment we realize there is something wrong, we can say in, the compiler could actually take care of it and could order them in a way that we never have this problem. Or we reduce the number of stalls that we have. And the hardware, you know what? Let the hardware be as stupid as it can. We are going to deal with it in the software. We are going to also look into these things. Uh, do you think there's a problem with that? I asked the question so I can drink air. <laughs> Who says, let the software solve it? <laughs> Not very good for the computer uh, science students. I mean, <laughs> you don't think you'll be able to solve it? The issue is not every problem will show itself during compile time. There are plenty of problems that occur during runtime. If you are reading from the memory, there will be contentions to memory to resources. Some memory will have a cache contention and will uh, return to you the value much longer. You cannot predict this while you're compiling the, uh, uh, your program. So we will see some of it will work, some of it will not work. The uh, other one, this is one of the gorgeous ones. We can do speculative executions. We can predict what value is needed before without knowing it and say, you know what? This is probably going to be the value. Go ahead, do it. And then in the end, we verify it. We make a guess, we say, I think it's going to be 10. Just go, take 10. You calculate it, you are about to finish and say, what, you took 10? No, no, it's actually 20. What do we do now? We flush everything, say, forget this happened. Men in black, <laughs> uh, you remember, men in black, wink, everything is cleaned and you start from scratch. Get a do over. And uh, the last one is do something else. So you realize that we have a problem. And uh, you are coming, and there are problems. There are all these five pipeline stages screaming and things like that. And maybe you have an architecture where it's possible. And you say, OK, hold on a minute. And you do something else. And while you are doing this something else, everything there stays. And some of the problems go away. And then after a while, you come back and say, what was that again? And maybe some of the problems have resolved. Now, the, the, uh, <laughs> one of my biggest problems is uh, sometimes people ask, uh, or people say, yeah, it was a great lecture. We laughed a lot. And it's like, OK, nobody understood something. It is, at least we laughed, you know? Um, but this is actually what goes on, you know? I mean, uh, it's maybe uh, explained a little bit humorously, but this is the story. Okay, I'm way behind my uh, lectures. Probably owner is going, hi, owner. He's going to be very mad with me. And tomorrow, we are going to handle, uh, we are going to uh, go through these, all of these, to see what kind of solutions we have. But tomorrow, we are not going to have any kind of role-playing games here, so it will be a uh, Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, thanks a lot, and see you tomorrow, hopefully.